Hello, everybody. Hi, Lori. I'm just submitting a bunch of people. Lori, let me make you a co-host here. Oh. Lori, do you want to share your screen with your slides? Welcome back, everybody. How's summer going? is uh who's in smoke right now that's what i really want to know nobody that's good i'm a little bit in smoke we have the vista fire and baldy right behind me thankfully not here oh good elizabeth elizabeth i'm so glad you're here yeah, me too thanks for the invite you're welcome all right. Well, as folks kind of continue to stream in, Lori, do you want to kick us off today? Sure. Hey, everybody. Um, hard to believe this is the 26th meeting when I was working up this slide. I was like, what the heck? How did this happen? Mm -hmm. um, uh, of course, my. Uh, there we go. Um we're going to go, if you can introduce yourself in the chat, that'd be great. Um, I'm not sure if we have any new members today. And then uh, Brett is going to do a presentation about data sovereignty and hopefully a rich discussion um, from everybody. Uh, challenges you're having with data sovereignties, ideas you're ha you have. If you're a tribal member or work for a tribe, concerns you have about protecting your own data. Um, and then reminding everybody that there's going to be a Tribal Climate Health Project Summit in November, and then we'll close it out on time. Great. Thank you, Lori. Um, and just a reminder, you know, we get together every two months now to connect national health and climate data experts and invite us all to exchange what we know about priority tribal adaptation and resilience data needs. Um, oftentimes we share tool practices and ideas. Today it will be around what NOAA is doing with data sovereignty. And um, a lot of times we like to explore opportunities to develop or scale up solutions. So that's what we always do. I really appreciate everybody continuing to come back. Um, I do think Nargis Jareen may be new. And I wondered if you would like to introduce yourself to the group. We like to... Let whoever is new say hello. And Annika's new as well, I, I think. Yeah, if you're new, please um, unmute yourself, say hello, just tell us who you are, uh, what organization you're with, what brought you here. My name's Annika Alexander Ozinskis. Um, I'm new to the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment in Sacramento, and I'm on the Tribal Indicators of Climate Change team there, um, working with Lori, luckily, and I'm here to listen and learn. Great. Are you in the position, Lori, you used to be in? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, we have a strong track record of really liking that person. <laughs> <laughs> Great. I'm Elizabeth Rhodes. I'm with the California Department of Public Health, and um, I'm filling in the role of our tribal climate change uh, specialist, which um, was the role that Osamu Kumasaka had, and he sadly left CDPH. So um, I'll be, uh, you know, our point person for our climate change work with tribes until we recruit that new position. That's right, Elizabeth. In my mind, you had been here before, but you're new, so. I may have been, at, you know, at one of them previously, that's possible, but yeah, I was his, I was his supervisor, so I'm filling in right now. Great. Um, Sarah from CARB, you guys have been here before, I think once, right? Here again, I'm excited for this presentation. Thank you. 
Oh, I'm having trouble hearing you. I see that you unmuted. Oh, can you hear me better now? Yeah. Oh, okay, great. Yeah, um, I'm Sarah Patiglio, she, her pronouns. Uh, I work in the research division at CARB and excited for this presentation. Thanks. Oh, perfect. And um, Nargis is also with you, right? Yes, uh, okay. Nargis is also, yeah, in the research division. Right, okay, I remember. Oh, right. Well, wonderful. Um, okay, we have a good group. Why don't we go ahead and go into our first item here? Oh, we're already able to um, Lost it. go to our next slide. All this one is, is member announcements. So it gives us a chance to kind of get caught up with anything that you all want to share. So if you have anything that's relevant for folks on this call, folks that are like you trying to figure out how to provide better access to climate related data and services for tribes to help them make adaptation decisions. Um, that would be something worth sharing now or just give us a little insight into the latest in the work that you're doing that's related. I don't know, Emily or Ben, if you guys want to talk about some of the fire, um, you know, the latest in your work on developing your fire uh, tool or analysis of the stuff we're working on together. Yeah, um, I have been working on putting together uh, the IRB Institutional Review Board protocol to conduct social science research, including interviews and surveys. Um, upcoming in, I forget when exactly that was, August or September. Um, and I met with the Colorado State University IRB office, and I have a um, just a, a path forward for Lori uh, and you, Angie, to get on that protocol to help uh, with that, you know, human subjects research. So I can follow up with you on that. Yep. Yep. We're in cahoots on it. Um, I wonder, Carb, do you guys have any updates from your research planning process? Hey, this is um, Sarah again. Uh, we <laughs> hope that at the next meeting we could announce the um, dates of the public meetings that we intend to have throughout the state to get input on environmental justice research ideas. Um, mm. But uh, unfortunately, we've been having trouble with our translation contract, so we don't have confirmation on those dates yet, but um, soon. Um, okay. Thanks. Yeah. Let me know if you'd like to um, spend a little time doing that at our next meeting, which will be September. Let's carve out some time for you. Okay, thanks. Anyone else? Oh, let's see, Teresa. Okay, hi, from Intertribal Long-Term Recovery Foundation at CSU Long Beach, great. Um, she says, not in a place to unmute my audio. I'm in SoCal, work with tribes in San Diego, Riverside and San Bernardino counties primarily. Hey, me too. I'm partnering with Climate Science Alliance on their Connects grant for lots of acronyms. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what ITL, oh, that must be you, okay. One of my challenges is trying to help my non-native colleagues get up to speed and learn better methodologies for sharing their expertise, especially around hydrology, water engineering, and analysis with tribes. Ooh, yes, yes, yes. That's a huge gap. And actually, yeah, I know you guys at Climate Science Alliance. We'd be happy to talk more with you guys about it. Let me, actually, I was just about to share this. We have an initiative at the Tribal Climate Health Project while maintaining tribal data sovereignty, yes, yes. Um, where we are trying to do some analysis on water also, and we're looking to bring in data scientists to help us navigate and understand the water security data that exists and is accessible to tribes, and then basically what doesn't exist and what might need to be uh, improved by the um, data makers and agencies that that can um, that might be something we work on with you if that's uh, if you guys are already down this track and uh, something we probably bring back to this group um, Isabel 
Hi. Isabel, did you want to say something? No, no. Oh, okay, I heard a peep. That was the parrot. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. Um, and just to follow that train of thought, if we are still looking for a data scientist, so I dropped the link in the chat. Um, it's not a ton of information, but really we're looking for folks that already have the expertise with both wildfire health and water security related data so like groundwater aquifer levels like how basically helping us answer the question of who um or what are the blind spots what do tribes need to know to understand the future of their water security um uh, from a water ground like a water supply perspective less about contamination um uh, that's kind of the answer we're trying to solve because every time i try to write an adaptation plan for tribes, especially in Southern California, that information is a lot trickier to find than it should be. And I feel like it's a giant blind spot. Tribes don't have a good, accurate way to understand how long, how long it's gonna be until it becomes really bad, I guess is the plain way to say it. Maybe you all at Climate Science Alliance, because you are scientists and maybe data scientists could work with us on that. Uh, but I would invite anybody else who has data scientist friends that might be interested in doing this kind of more of an independent contractor work to send that send that information their way. All right. Anyone else with updates? Oh, hi, Ben. Oh, good. Just introducing yourself. Claudia, I see you got here. Thank you. Hey, sorry to be late. Yeah, no problem. We're just doing member announcements. So last call, if there's anything else you want folks on the call to know, and then we're going to just jump into the meat of our conversation today with Noah. Okay. Well, Lori, why don't you uh, introduce this session, the section? I'm super excited about this because data sovereignty is a subject that is more complicated than I understood at first. And so um, that Noah has thought about this and is willing to kind of share with us where they're going and some ideas I think is great. And um, I think Brett is hoping for a rich discussion afterwards too. So take it away, Brett. Yeah, thank you both. Um, and let me just preface this with the caveat that I certainly do not speak for Noah. I am one of, I think, about 16,000 of us. Uh, <laughs> um, and, and I'll go into that a little bit, but I, I can share some things that uh, Noah as a whole is doing, as well as some things that my office, specifically the Office for Coastal Management, is doing. So I will uh, go ahead and share my screen. As long as it works, let's see, share screen. Tab. Okay. So is everybody seeing this all right? Okay, fantastic. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Um, I'm Brett Folger. I am, uh, I am, I'm on contract with NOAA's Office for Coastal Management, and I'm the West Coast Regional Geospatial Coordinator uh, covering California, Oregon, and Washington. I live up in Hood River, which Hood River, Oregon, uh, it, which is the traditional homelands of the Wasco Wishram people, um, among many others who used this area as a trading post, a highway, et cetera. Um, so I have, I have quite a broad focus in my position, but much of what I, much of what I do revolves around bringing federal data, tools, and training materials from the Digital Coast, which is our website and online hub, to coastal communities to help them reduce their vulnerability to hazards. Um, I partner with states and counties, NGOs, and tribes, and more to help get resources where they will be most useful. And um, I'm also helping to guide how we change our programs and processes at OCM to better support indigenous communities and respect indigenous data sovereignty. Um, so I'll give a, a, a brief little 
background on OCM and NOAA, just so people have some context for how we work um, before going into some of the things that Router NOAA is doing and some of what we're doing at OCM. Um, so NOAA is primarily made up of six line offices. Um, as I said, there's about 16,000 people who work for NOAA. Um, and these six line offices include the National Marine Fisheries Service, the National Weather Service, um, and uh, the, one, the one I'm part of is the National Ocean Service. And there are more, but um, these are some of the, the ones more people have, have heard about. And so OCM is within the National Ocean Service, along with groups like the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries um, and Office of Coast Survey and, and those groups. So um, fisheries is definitely the biggest biggest line office. Um, one person covers fisheries, whereas another person covers the other five line offices. But but uh, but but OCM is within the National Ocean Service. So this is also also to to, to just communicate that that we're very large with very varied missions. Um, and so I, I can't speak for all of us, but I can speak for what OCM is doing and some other parts that I do know about. So, um, so NOAA, so, so what does OCM do? Um, my, my shop at, at our core, we do, we, we manage the National Coastal Zone Management Program, the National Estuary and Research Reserve System, the Coral Reef Conservation Program and the, and the Digital Coast. Um, I'll just, I'll touch on a couple of these because the Nat National Coastal Zone Management Program is a, a nationwide program that basically funnels money from the federal government to the states to help reduce coastal vulnerability in their, uh, in, in their coastal zone. So basically each, each state designates a state organization or multiple state organizations that will um, manage the funding and then manage the work. And in California, it's uh, the California Coastal Commission, the State Coastal Conservancy, and uh, in the Bay, the Bay Conservation and Development uh, Commission. Then Digital Coast is where we, it's sort of my office's data tool and training hub for creating a well-prepared coastal zone. And it includes things such as LIDAR data, uh, imagery, um, land cover data, all in their raw forms, but then also ocean planning data, uh, sea level rise planning tools, et, et cetera. So that's much of what I do is try to bring those to where, where people will use them. Um, and and I think more recently, a, a place that we have been able to expand our scope because of huge amounts of funding coming in from the inflation or from the bipartisan infrastructure law and the Inflation Reduction Act is that we've been able to offer grants um, to a much wider array of audiences. So we're quite a large grants shop. We do a lot of pass-through funding to the coastal zone management programs, the estuary and research reserves, and more, but recently we've been able to offer a much broader funding to, um, to regional coalitions and also to specifically to tribes um, for specific ocean related activities. Um, one other thing I don't have on here is that we are, we co-manage the National uh, Coastal Resilience Fund or NCRF with the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. So that's another way in which tribes get a lot of money coming through our office. Um, so that's that's sort of just some some core things that we do. Um, just to just to provide a little context to what I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so so much of much of my work since I was brought on a couple of years ago um, has been around figuring out how we at OCM as part of NOAA can can be better stewards of our federal trust responsibility to uh, federally recognized tribes on the West Coast in the space of data and and uh, and geospatial data and data management. And so I, you know, I, I knew some I needed to learn a lot more. And so uh, so so part of that has been understanding what the status quo has been for the federal government for the past uh, however many decades and how it uh, works with tribes. Um, and I, I think as, you know, I, this isn't something I need to really share with this group. I'm sure everybody mostly knows that 
th th through, throughout most of history, um, the relationship between the federal government and tribes has been a violent one, has been a, an extractive one. Um, I think historically it was very extractive in terms of knowledge, artifacts, resources, and more by academia, the private sector and government agencies um, in the 70s with some, some laws signed in the 30s and then the 70s with some laws signed by uh, the, the presidents at the time. Um, things, I think, shifted slightly more towards tribal self-determination. However, federal agencies still seem to kind of ignore this, um, both, both legal and ethical responsibilities to indigenous peoples um, and or uh, the co-opting of indigenous knowledge and beliefs and art to sort of take it and make it about the agency or you know, pat themselves on the back in some way. And that's sort of how things have generally gone. Um, now, I think recently there has been more of a shift, more of uh, an effort, um, at least a shift by agencies to recognize sovereignty and to... Um, to, I think, pursue co-production and co-development of work. So um, starting with the recognition of indigenous sovereignty and then where, where uh, it is desired, um, co-producing and develop or co-developing co data sets with shared resources and respecting tribal preferences about how those data are used. Um, and I think more importantly, the recognition of indigenous knowledge as an equal or stronger knowledge system to Western science and where it is desired or where it makes sense uh, in co-development, integrating indigenous knowledge uh, with Western science to, to create a stronger, um, I suppose, depending on the scenario, stronger outcome, whatever it may be. Um, so, so, you know, th there is a, there is a general shift, um, shift there within NOAA. And I think that's likely because, you know, at least in this administration at NOAA and under the current presidential administration, there have been a lot of, um, there's been a lot of staffing that has been created to help, help develop this. So, um, the, 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 the director of NOAA right now has multiple senior tribal liaisons on staff that, that report directly to him to help guide his broader efforts, you know, taking these uh, six line offices, these dozens of smaller offices and ensuring that they have um, some aspect of improving tribal relations as part of their work. Um, that those, those senior tribal liaisons help guide a tribal relations team with representation from tribes across the US and the Pacific Islands. And the National Ocean Service, my line office, has a tribal team that helps guide the work of each office within the National Ocean Service. And I'm, you know, I'm I'm I would say quite far down the NOAA ladder, but I can reach out to those people and talk with them and and receive guidance on how to um, how to go about certain things that I need to do. So, so they're doing a very good job of taking, um, you know, the, I think the goals of both the presidential administration and filtering them down to the everyday operations that we have to, to make sure that we are, we're being respectful, we're being ethical, but I think more than meeting requirements, we are, we are building relationships um, and, and hearing what is needed from tribal communities um, but what they need from us. So I think first, uh, Noah last year released an indigenous knowledge guidance document, um, that, that, uh, you know, was developed to provide best practices, uh, designed to ensure that sharing, the sharing and application of indigenous knowledge is responsible, effective, and mutually beneficial. And this was a good step in in the direction of acknowledging the, the importance of indigenous knowledge and starting to open up some of our programming to indigenous knowledge. Um, I think in, in many cases, as I'm sure some of you know, grant opportunities and other things like that 
uh, require too narrow of a Western science lens um, for how to manage resources, whether it's coastal resources, whether it's um, uh, oh, you know, ocean resources, fisheries resources, etc., and it's it's made it very difficult for for tribes and other um, indigenous peoples around the entire U.S. territory to participate in those and to gain recognition for the how useful their knowledge has been. And so, this is an effort to open that up and be more uh, inclusive. Um, and, and just this past year. Or, sorry, just this past month, they updated this guidance to include very specific guidance about how to handle Freedom of Information Act requests for data that NOAA is involved in that may be culturally sensitive or be something that tribes do not want to be made public. And so uh, that was a huge step in the right direction because FOIA was kind of like the last, the last thing that we couldn't quite figure out how to protect against. And I think that there are now ways and there are... Um, strategies to do this and so that that's being thought about at the highest levels both with the, the legal team and the senior tribal liaisons and that's been very helpful in my work because i was getting direct questions from tribes about we want to apply for this grant but how can we ensure that you will you will uh you will respect our our sovereignty in this and and i i didn't have a good answer um which did not feel good um and especially as we were putting out these grant opportunities that are meant to extend more uh, capacity to tribes to protect their coastline and protect their communities. If we couldn't ensure data sovereignty, then then those those grant opportunities were as good as dead to them, um, which which wasn't wasn't good for anybody, right? Um, so so some progress there. Uh, quickly, the 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 next thing. Well, yeah, sorry, I'll. I'll, I'll skip through that. But the, the next thing is the NOAA Equitable Climate Services Action Plan. There's a, a, a large survey that went out, I think, last year to try to get a better idea of how NOAA could provide uh, climate services more equitably. And a huge, um, huge part of this, was, well, a, a large part of, um, a large part of the, they sort of came up with five five uh, points about how they might deliver services more equitably. And priority two was ensuring data equity in, in all products and services. And a key piece was incorporating the fair and care principles of data management um, into everything that we do uh, and, and all of the directives within NOAA. Um, and I, I won't go into those now just for time purposes, but if anybody is not familiar with those, they're very, um, they're, they're very good ethical principles for how to manage and share data. So give them a quick Google. Um, now, uh, th those are those are two big things that NOAA from from the top down is doing, which is very helpful at my level because we have something to point to. We can we can do things without worrying that they might not be legal or they might not be shared by broader NOAA. Um, and those are meant to filter down through all of our processes. So um, asking everyone who is working with tribes to consider these data management principles and anyone who's not working with tribes to have a hard and fast look at what, what, uh, what gaps there may be in your service delivery uh, where you should be engaging with and consulting with tribes, but currently are not. Um, so more specifically on my level at, at the Office for Coastal Management, um, there, there are a, a few main things um, that, that we're doing on data sovereignty. And first, that's around remote sensing data collection protocols. So primarily here, I'm talking about LIDAR data, um, which is a way to basically collect a surface model, map a surface model of of the ground. It's really helpful for sea level rise mapping because you need accurate elevation data. But, uh, and, and, and my office occasionally does data collections that we also host a bunch of data. Um, and, and it's been found that, that LIDAR data, really high resolution LIDAR data, which it is now, can reveal culturally sensitive information, whether it be burial grounds or artifacts or whatnot. And we didn't have any protocol for reaching out to tribes. We would just 
I guess, collect data over their over their lands um, and not not consider their needs, which is I I believe in in um, violation of executive order. I think I think it's one three one seven five. But basically, I've now been I and some colleagues have been working to create an outreach protocol and ensure we have consent before doing doing those sorts of data collections. Um, and we also host a lot of data that we haven't collected that other people have collected. So I'm also doing some some outreach to tribes to uh, to figure out if we need to take some of that data down, if we need to redact the data. Um, the next thing is in the data sharing and management requirements. So very similar to the NOAA directive, we, we put out a lot of grants and a lot of them now are going to tribes. And this is sort of what I mentioned earlier, of can you protect our data? Um, and so we went through a lot of legal research and whatnot to determine whether or not we could protect their data legally. And now we, we do have some guidance in place that allows us to do that, which was huge because, because the biggest way capacity is built, right, is through direct funding to, uh, to develop resilience plans, to develop vulnerability assessments, to literally move infrastructure in cases of managed retreat, which we have up here in Washington State and up in Alaska. So this was a big one. Um, one thing I'll, I'll also mention that I'm not directly involved in, but I know a decent amount is NOAA's work in Alaska. Um, specifically, my office has created, or developed a partnership with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium over the past few years. <clears throat> and they're doing, and THC is doing just incredible work around the state to support, uh, to support the native villages. Uh, I think over 40% of uh, federally recognized tribes live in Alaska and most of rural Alaska is, um, that most of rural Alaska's population is made up by, uh, by indigenous people. And so this has been a rapidly developing partnership to help provide base level data development up in Alaska where it doesn't exist to help uh, coastal communities understand their risk and take actions to, to um, to build resilience. I think this, this especially became important after Typhoon Murbach hit the, uh, the, western, the western coast of Alaska. Um, oh, so a, a few challenges and gaps. Um, I'm gonna try to wrap up pretty soon, but a few challenges and gaps. Re remote sensing data outreach is slow and we don't have much capacity for it. Uh, we're trying to we're doing trying to do our best to treat every tribe individually, right, um, and have dialogue with with every tribe in the coastal zone. But there are there are hundreds, um, and that's only federally recognized tribes. So it's it's slow going and it's hard and it it, it makes it, it it upsets me um, to be to be honest because. We, we want to be as respectful as possible without painting everybody with a broad brush. We also don't want to start by taking down all the data when perhaps there are tribes that are using data that's out there. So um, it's difficult, and but we're trying to take it one step at a time. And, you know, more and more capacity is opening up for these sorts of things. So hopefully it, it's better. Um, if, uh, another thing is that coordination across all of NOAA can be very difficult. We have a great community of practice for all folks who are working with or who are engaging with indigenous communities, but um, figuring out what other people are doing is hard. Everybody's busy and, and nobody's staffed to, to really just tell, tell other people what's going on. Um, I find it particularly important, you know, partly why I'm here, partly why I want to talk to people and know what's going on so that we can not duplicate efforts and whatnot, other things like that. Um, and finally, indigenous knowledge is not generalizable. You know, I think as many of you know, federal agencies love things that are generalizable. We're big, we have broad directives, um, and we like to take things and try to stuff them into like an 80% box that, that'll cover a decent percent of the population. And this just, this is, this is challenging for how we do things. Um, I think it's great because we need that, um, but it's not, you know, we are needing to develop new ways of considering things. Um, 
to, to I think to put it bluntly. And it's it's a challenge. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it's a very good thing, but um, it's a challenge. Lastly, uh, Coastal Geo Tools in 2025 is happening in January. That's a, a, a coastal geospatial conference my office puts on, and we're part of the way we're trying to also help um, expand our support of uh, tribes in the coastal zone is to highlight strong coastal geospatial work. So if anybody knows of anyone doing this sort of work, um, please let me know. We'd love to get an abstract in for that. Um, next, Garrett Couch at Tribal GIS is working with the US Forest Service to act as an intermediary between tribes and the Forest Service and, and hold data that was co-collected and developed um, and create a data licensing agreement that allows, that, that basically protects data from a FOIA request or anything like that, but both the tribes and the Forest Service can access it. So that's a really, um, a really interesting and innovative thing that's going on that, you know, typically we as a federal agency aren't coming up with the innovative ways to do things, right? Um, but <clears throat> these external groups like Tribal GIS are, are developing that, which is fantastic. And I hope that gains steam. Um, and, and finally, there's, there are more grant opportunities and grant writing support uh, occurring across the federal government um, at NOAA, at EPA, at FEMA, um, these different groups so that, so that more funding can be funneled to tribes, but also more assistance can be provided to them to help them understand and, and, um, and like basically just get the funding because some tribes have tons of capacity and you know, have more capacity than we do it at OCM and other tribes have very little. So um, there's there's more of that coming out. And I, I know there's kind of an inundation of funding right now that many groups are facing, um, but hopefully hopefully capacity can be built and, and more money can be taken advantage of. Um, I think I've, I've gone a little bit over my time, but um, but I, I wanted to hit all of those things. So that's that's all I have, but please, take down my email. And if you have any questions about what we're doing at OCM or other folks are doing, um, or just want to chat about any of this stuff, I'm always happy to, um, and, and also happy to connect you with folks at uh, other offices in NOAA, if I can. Thanks. Wow, well, thanks, Brett. I was, um, I was impressed that the words mutually beneficial made it into the guidance document. Mm -hmm. I would have expected a, a, a knockdown drag out for that. Um, <laughs> I think I think Lori, one thing I'd also like to just briefly mention is that um, mutually beneficial is sort of at the at the heart of all of this. Um, there's there's a lot of philosophy and ethics that I you know didn't get into, but the 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 thing I heard most when trying to figure out how best to support tribes and on the West Coast is to start with with relationship building. Um, and to start with, to start with dialogue and conversation, and, and basically being a, a person and a human first, um, be, and 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 having that conversation instead of being the, the federal agency that comes in and tells people what to do. Um, uh, my office has, at least for with the coastal community, has always tried to go to the coastal community to see what they need to help help us develop digital coast because. We, we can't just spend taxpayer dollars developing things that nobody's going to use. And so in that same vein, I, you know, we're trying to first go to go to tribes and say, is there anything we can do? Here's what we have to offer. Is this, are there things here that work or are there things we need, we need to expand and, and, and try to do? So, so that, that mutually beneficial um, aspect is, is both a, a guide guidepost and also a reminder to us that we aren't the only ones that have something to provide. We can we have a lot to learn from historical practices, from cultural practices, etc., from tribes, um, if if they are willing to share with us. So, with that, I'm done. <laughs> that was a great point. Folks have questions. Uh I do, but I would love to hear from others as well. And also just wanted to encourage Brett, if there's if there's discussion prompts you want for this group. So this group is some of the 
folks thinking into a lot of these issues, you know, providing access to data, but also having to protect it. So if there's um, there's something that's your sort of a question you're holding that you could use some, I don't know, peer thinking into, uh, I'd be happy to entertain that as well. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I suppose I'm just, I'm curious what, uh, what folks, you know, I, I think much of this stuff, the more crowdsourced the information can be, the better. So anyone's experiences with, or just anecdotes of uh, working with tribes and hearing concerns about data sovereignty. I know that's extremely broad, but I think it's a, a good place to start. And two, um, any ideas for how to, you know, you can't, and it can't just hire more people to help with lack of capacity issues often. So what are some ways that we get at lack of capacity without just hiring people? Because that's how we can reach more people and, he and hear from more tribes. Um, I know, Angie, I'm sure you have, you have thoughts about that. Um, but, you know, I, I think about groups, um, places you can go to coordinate and things, but it's difficult. And so I, I just I, I want to put that out there to see almost as a little brainstorming to see what folks have. Does anybody want to volunteer experiences with tribal data sovereignty and ideas, I guess, for how to streamline engagement and, and sort of preserve capacity? I'll share a little while people are thinking. Um, we did a we did a webinar series through the Tribal Climate Health Project um, a year ago with what we were considering there are more seasoned tribal practitioners that have gone through the adaptation planning process. And so one of the things we were talking about was we had a whole session on, um, we, call, we called it accessing and protecting cultural data in TEK for climate trend analysis and real time action. And what came up for us in developing that conversation that training, which was really more of a conversation with these guys, um, was use cases. Like thinking through from the tribal tribe's perspective where data sovereignty issues rear its ugly head, like in what functional ways. Um, and one being tribal, so tribal planning, like it rears its head there, right? So tribes needing data, needing to access uh, needing to sort of braid its own information alongside of Western data, but also needing to protect it. So having limits to how much it could be shared externally. So how, do, how does the tribe protect its own data? Uh, so gathering and storing it safely themselves, sharing only sharing externally only what they feel comfortable doing that and then filtering public reports for sensitive information. Another one, though, is external planning. So like where well, tribes often want to see their knowledge being used and recognized and respected in a local state or federal planning process, there's this big conflict about we want it used, but we don't really want, we don't want to exploit it. And I think that's the really tricky one to get right. And I would say OPR, I wish OPR was here, here in California, because I think they've done a lot of thinking into that, but I would encourage any the other California agencies here to chime in on how they're thinking about that and trying to solve it. Um, just knowing that, you know, tribes are, they just, they have a, you know, good history of being mistrusted, misinterpreted or omitted when they do share information. Uh, and that they really need to protect their cultural resources and sites. Um, and not be specific about details. And that makes it really challenging to protect things. So you, you can only protect what you, what you know is threatened, but if you can't tell anybody what's being threatened, how can we protect it, right? So if you're dealing with like coastal sea level rise um, and there's a burial ground or a gathering space or some other cultural landmark, but you don't really wanna tell people what it is, how are you gonna get them to help you protect it, especially when it's not on your lands? Um, super tricky. And so like there's this, the onus kind of becomes on maybe the planner to figure out like the right level of information to gather that can be publicly shared and protect that tribe, not request information that's dangerous to release 
but do it in a way that like points to specific areas that need to be protected, but not give information about why. Um, One and of the uh, things. Third, I'm sorry. Sorry, uh, I'm don't sorry. Say the last one is grant reporting, but you already touched on that. And, you know, what we're suggesting there is just what you've done, which is to try to change the requirements for documentation that's sensitive that has to be reported. Sorry, go ahead, Lori. I was going to say one of the things that I found helpful is if agencies um, get better about compensating tribes, those statement of works or um, documents that we require to give away the money is a good place to embed that data sovereignty and to remind ourselves that that information isn't to be shared. So I know that um, for WEHA, when we did a statement of works for these private climate change um, reports, that right in that statement of work, we stated nothing's going to be shared without permission. And that reminds the agency, and it also gives you a chance if you're working with somebody and they start to say, tell you where something is, say, do you want that public or do you want to just say that it's an important resource? You want to tell us what it is? You don't need to. You can just say resources in the area. You don't need to pinpoint. Um, does NOAA, Brett, does NOAA require waivers of sovereign immunity? Have they dropped that from their grants? I'm not entirely sure. What 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 do those waivers typically say? So with the state, and it's getting less and less so, but for a long time, with any grant, we request a waiver of sovereign immunity. So basically, we take away all of the rights of tribe has as a sovereign nation in order to get the money. And finally, tribes started to say, forget it. If that's part of it, I'm not going to apply for the grant. And then, then suddenly we were willing to consider dropping that. But it's been a part of lots and lots of grants. And so different agency copy, we copy each other's grants and then we're, we include it because somebody else included, US EPA included it, so we have to include um, and it, so it's it's interesting to see who and how that's falling away. Yeah, that's uh, I didn't I didn't know about that, and that's unfortunate. Um, I don't think that that is part of our grant processes at all. Um, I, I think if it still were, I would definitely uh, have have come up against it at times. But I'm gonna I'll I'll do a little deeper look to see maybe when that was removed because that's that'd be still a good part of the history. Thank you. Who else in here is working on data sovereignty? I'd love to hear some other perspectives of what you're learning. Or even if you have, if you're not learning anything, if you just have questions, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah. That. I have a super newbie question. Um, and so I kind of was going to wait <laughs> until the end. And, Do it. Uh, it's a safe no, space. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> it's a safe space. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, I spent some time in Canada and um, got to read a lot of publications from First Nations, Métis, and Inuit populations. And I also got to... Um, attend a really amazing conference where um, a lot of those nations spoke and um, there was what I appreciated learning about this perspective of um, tribes saying, well, we don't, or, you know, in this case, First Nation Inuit and Métis saying we don't really want to be integrated. <laughs> we don't want to integrate with your systems. We don't want to be braided, you know, like we are 
our knowledge stands on its own. Our wisdom does not need to be validated. It does not need to be translated. You know, there were a bunch of words where they were like pushing back and saying, we don't want, I actually don't want that. What we want is just to be listened to, believed, trusted, you know, um, respected. And um, in cases of, of data sovereignty, I think it was kind of coming up that instead of being integrated into existing databases, it would perhaps be better for them to build the capacity for their own format, their own storage system, et cetera. Um, and I'm just curious, like how that has been going here in, in California, where I haven't been um, tuned into the same topics. Um. Great, great question, Elizabeth, and not a newbie question at all. That's a fantastic question. Um, I, I can't speak much towards California, but I think something that yeah we have come across is a large diversity of perspectives and desires across many of the tribes I've worked work with, and that's I think an inherent uh, care. You know, and it, I think that's just the nature of how this works is that. There are 574 federally recognized tribes. Uh, there are hundreds more non-federally recognized and they are all sovereign nations. Um, and they all have the right to a different desire, preference, um, request about how their knowledge, how their culture is uh, utilized by outside groups, whether it's the US federal government, whether it's another tribe whether it's the Canadian government. Um, and that's that's just the way it goes, right? That's that's part of sovereignty. Um, and so when we've come to that, it's uh, okay, you know, that's, that's your preference and we will respect it. And we are here to, you know, we're happy to, you know, if, if we have interaction, if we have engagement, wonderful. We will not try to take your knowledge or your culture to, and put it in any sort of Western um, structure. Uh, and that's that's sort of that. And if there, you know, if that changes, we're here. If not, great. You know, it's 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 just a matter of uh, respecting sovereignty at that point, I think. Um, but but yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure any examples of that in California. Angie, I'm sure you or Lori know more about that than I do. Um, but I think, yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that's just the nature of how sovereignty works. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I hear a lot about tribal GIS uh, and their work, but I'm not involved in it enough to talk about it. I just worry because we're talking about like we're talking about capacity. I don't I feel like I work with a lot of the higher capacity tribes and I'm not sh the capacity to build their own tools uh, or databases like this sounds it just sounds difficult um, just based on scale uh, and how difficult it is even for the federal government to develop, develop these tools and align them so they're use, useful and user-friendly. I, I just, I get concerned, although it makes me think about what we're doing with Colleen, if you're still here. Oh, I did you see you? Um, with the folks at the Public Health Alliance, and we are, we got a DEC grant recently, a tribal research grant to basically take their healthy places index and build functionality to do an extreme heat tool for tribes using the Tribal Climate Health Project easy tool, which um, one of the things we came across there is like, okay, if we're going to present data to tribes and try to get more data to be more accessible and meaningful for tribes, what if that presents a problem for the tribes when it becomes publicly accessible? And thinking into um, maybe that means we need to create uh, password protected profiles for tribes. So like the data that is accessible to them, even though it's kind of public, the data may still only be viewed um, by them. Uh, but that's even, that's just the one way information. That's just data that's being shared. It's not asking tribes for anything. I think it gets more challenging when the tribes are producing uh, their knowledge or data themselves. Um, I see some other comments here in the chat. It looks like Emily and Ben might want to talk to you more, Brett, because they're working on uh, they're working on NOAA stuff, <laughs> and they want to chat with you further. And Teresa, 
She's talking about working on data sovereignty with tribes at the on oh California Native American Heritage Commission and LA County. These are non federally recognized or state recognized insofar as they are named most likely descendants. But that said, these groups are nonprofits and organize themselves like tribal governments and seek to be consulted without federal status in the land base. Their input and value is not always held to the same level in regard. I think it's federally recognized tribes. Yeah. Flip side of the problem is that tribes outside of LA County and Orange County, for that matter, realize that their ancestral lands do not extend to LA or OC, and then a huge gap emerges in understanding tribal knowledge and data needs. Yeah, that one's that's tricky. Um, thank you, and thank you, everybody. Um, want to give one chance for any final thoughts, and I'm going to just do one annoying thing here, which is drop for Noah's be, um, benefit or um, maybe benefit, hopefully. I'm dropping the better funding report that I recently published, which is um, speaks to a lot of the capacity issues you're talking about. It gives suggestions, like 70 different suggestions for how state and federal agencies can deliver funding yeah. to tribes and local governments to try to address climate needs. Um, and anyways, there's things like, you know, we talk a lot about not requiring sensitive data as part of grant applications, but we're also talking about the challenges around engaging tribes and other low capacity communities in all of this, you know, really well-intentioned engagement, right? Like every agency wants to know what tribes need and wants to make sure their stuff works and there's just not enough time in the day. And so it's the, it's proposing some pilots that we're actually already working on here in California that streamline that engagement, create a home for it, and make it easier for everybody to take advantage of. So there's one idea or 70 ideas for you to mull over. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Angie. I'll check it out. It's all good stuff. <laughs> all right. Um, do you want the final word, Brett? No, oh, I've said enough. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Brett. Oh, Lori, yeah, you're going to tell us a bit about our summit. Tribal Climate Health Summit's coming up in November, November 6th and 7th down at Paula. Um, we're going to be focusing on wildfire, drought, and heat. So uh, we're, we'll have the registration up soon. Um, come. It's great. Next meeting uh, is in September. We should be reaching out to this group too, um, both to invite you, but also to solicit some of you to be speakers. And then um, our next meetings in September. And I'm going to reach out to CARB and Water Boards because I heard that you have stuff coming up. So. Oh, perfect. Great. Thank you, guys. We'll see you in September. Thank, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thanks again, thank Brett. Yeah, thank you guys. Take care.